are listening to the Secure World Sessions, a cybersecurity podcast that gives you access. Access granted. Access to people and ideas that inspire and inform. Welcome to episode 53 of the Remote Sessions podcast. Fantastic to have you here today. Whether you're, you know, cruising around running errands or, you know, maybe you're working from home and just grabbing a little lunch break, something like that. It's, it's great to have you with us. And I am excited because today we are going to take a look at the threat landscape within the oil and natural gas sector. Obviously, a critical part of our energy infrastructure. And to do that, we get to dip into the knowledge that was uh, uncorked recently at Secure World Texas. We had a panel discussion. I was privileged to moderate it as the opening keynote, and it was with Travis Herman, who is an information security advisor for Devon Energy Group, Katrina Watts, who's the cyber security threat analyst for the ONG ISAC, Stuart Wagner, who is the senior director of IT security and compliance at Enterprise Products, again, uh, also chairman of the ONG ISAC, and Angela Hahn, who is the executive director of the ONG ISAC, and she's a former FBI agent. So it's fantastic because we're gonna pick their minds in this panel, as you'll hear, and we're just gonna hear some clips of it. First of all, the threat landscape, how does it look now? Second of all, what is threat intelligence? and information sharing in the petroleum industry look like or potentially what could it look like and how do you overcome some of the challenges? And then lastly, we're gonna talk about the future, right? And evolving threats. Where do we see things going for this part of the energy industry? So with that, let's dip on into Secure World Texas as we uh, kick off the panel and I ask about the current threat landscape. Well, at this point, I would like to move into kind of what I call the level set part of our conversation. And let's talk about the threat landscape as we see it right now. And Travis, I thought since you kind of kicked off the introductions, maybe I can come back to you and ask you about examples of threats that that you're concerned about and the impact these type of threats may have on the oil and natural gas industry. So so what do you think? Herbert, thanks. Well, uh, the threats can be kind of grouped in several different uh, buckets that we're concerned with, mainly at at Devon Energy. Um, We're uh, primarily produce oil and natural gas. We don't have uh, filling stations and convenience stores and things like that, like you would see with an Exxon or a BP. And so our threats are a little bit different from those. Um, We share a few of the same threats that you might hear from Stuart, but uh, basically the threats we're concerned about would be, of course, nation state threats. Things nation states may do would be espionage, where they try to steal the way we produce and find uh, oil and gas resources. Um, those nation states may have a destructive capability, which we've seen that they're uh, very willing to use. Um, we monitor geopolitical uh, tensions, which increase risk, obviously. For example, last year when you see the uh, political tensions rise around the state of or nation of Iran, um, we see a pretty uh, well-timed attacks increase from, from that region. Um, another bucket of risk we monitor is e-crime, um, particularly for our type of uh, entity. Uh, we're concerned with ransomware, um, business partner compromises where an e-criminal may compromise a business partner and try to pivot into our um, environment. And uh, data leakage can from those type of attacks. A trend we've seen in the last few months is where uh, ransomware attackers or e-criminals will will exfiltrate data, and then instead of just, um, for example, holding your computers, uh, you know, as prisoners with ransomware, they threaten to release the data. Well, that's a a risk. Another risk or big buckets we're we're concerned around is uh, ICS and SCADA, uh, field automation, where, you know, we have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of oil wells out in the across the nation. Um, obviously, they're, most of them are automated, the day-to-day operation where, you know, from the central office, they can be monitored, flows, production, and things like that. So uh, that automation could be at risk of attack. That's what we're concerned with that. Um, another threat we're concerned with, uh, not as much in the last couple of years, but it adds and flows with, with the um, political climate is hacktivism and activism. 
So a few years ago, as an example, um, you probably are familiar with No Dapple, where they were building a pipeline up in the northern part of the United States. Um, we did see uh, activism in Oklahoma City, for example, people going up and down the um, the streets uh, protesting or trying to, you know, uh, chain their self to pipelines in Cushing, which is about six miles from where I live. And so those big buckets are, are things we're concerned with. Um, with the activism, hacktivism, a lot of times uh, there are um, hackers that, that monitor the activists, and when they see them uh, decide to attack an entity or, or to do something, they offer their services, and you know, like an anonymous type group or something like that. And so, obviously, we're concerned with that, even though we may not have a, a, a um, an office in North or South Dakota. Um, the hackers don't care where you're, you're at. They find your, your headquarters or your perimeter, your DMZs, and they, they may try to hack away. And so those are the big buckets that we're concerned with, Bruce. Yeah, that's, that's quite a list. I mean, those are a lot of buckets that you have to keep an eye on. So really appreciate that perspective. That's great. And Angela, I thought this would be a natural question for you as well. I mean, based on your time with the FBI and then your current role with the Oil and Natural Gas Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Um, give us some insights on what you're seeing around the threat landscape right now. Sure. Um, <laughs> this year, 2020, has been a doozy, right? I think we can all admit that the, the landscape has changed. It just, uh, it's been a fundamental shift. Uh, we started off with um, some concerns in January, early part of the year, about a nation state attack with in rest retaliation uh, for the death of a high profile uh, individual overseas. Um, and it's been up to the races kind of ever since. But since March, you know, there, there's some truly um, challenging and concerning issues related to telework and, and, and a more broad uh, vulnerability landscape of, of remote workers. Um, I believe that our members in the industry have done a phenomenal job. They've worked together, shared lessons learned, um, but it has been a challenge to overcome. Uh, the, the attacks both on the fraud front, um, with COVID-19 being a very big lure for spear phishing campaigns, and, um, and, and getting that access into the network, uh, even if it's uh, remote, has been, you know, a big issue. But, you know, they've really stepped up to the challenge and they've uh, addressed concerns. Um, I, I think that the protocols that they've put in place have uh, really elevated uh, the security to the extent that you can when you have such a broad surface of attack. Um, I think the ISAC, we are trying really hard to make sure we're sharing that kind of lessons learned and providing that trusted forum to uh, engage each other. And even if it's submitting information anonymously to the ISAC, having attribution removed and getting it out to the good of the whole so that if someone else is seeing it, they're more prepared to prevent block and tackle with, uh, you know, getting out in front of some of these things. Because afterwards, it's, you know, then you're just trying to clean up the map. So what you can do to be preventative is a tremendous help. Um, so we anonymize and we work together to, uh, to reduce the threat. Yeah, fantastic. And you're right. I mean, it's just the prevention. What's that saying? Like an, out, a pound, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? <laughs> yeah. So very good, Angela. Okay, thank you. Appreciate both of you for kind of helping us with the level set part of our conversation today. I'd like to turn to Stuart. And Stuart, I'd like to ask you about the challenges around uh, sharing cyber threat intelligence and and how do you think these can be addressed so would you you know give us some ideas that you're thinking about this question okay so yeah the idea of information threat sharing is great uh, but it's not as simple as it sounds uh, there's a lot of roadblocks we run into uh, first of all just from uh, legal issues uh, a lot of times are uh, legal departments, our uh, attorneys and counsel, they've got concerns around sharing information, a lot of which can be addressed through an ISAC. Uh, this, all this information that's shared is protected by legal agreements, plus it's exempt from Freedom of Information Acts. Uh, it actually avoids breaching your client attorney privilege uh, 
uh, privileges kept when you share threat indicators through an ISAC. Uh, also, uh, there's been some guidance given by the FTC around the uh, sharing threat indicators and threat information does not violate or create a anti uh, violate antitrust rules. Uh, there's also some aspects to the ONG ISAC that can help as well. There's the ability to remove attribution so you can share the information out with other members without having it attributed back to your company. Uh, we've got uh, agreements in place that with a traffic light protocol that indicates how that information can be shared. So some information can be shared freely. Others have to be other aspects of information have to be retained very tightly based on how the member decides it should be rated. And a lot of it, just talk to your your counsel, uh, your legal department, and have a conversation with them up front. The worst time to talk with them is in the middle of an incident when you're dealing with a stressful situation. It's much better to work this out ahead of time. Yeah, that that makes okay. sense. It follows on the, the, what, what Angela was talking about. Yeah, yeah work it out. So, yeah, and then there's other things you can do also is like set ground rules with your uh, counsel as far as what you're allowed to share whether you're allowed to share with attribution or without, uh, get agreement on that up front. And this also goes into your analyst, your security analyst working on it as well. You want to make sure they understand the ground rules, rules as well because they're going to be hesitant to share information if they don't get the uh, authorization to do so. Also, analysts are really busy. Uh, they've got their day-to-day -day job. Submitting information to the ISAC is extra work on their part, and the ISAC created a reporting template that makes it easier for an analyst to do that. They don't have to uh, go through a lot of work to report uh, indicators or other information. Uh, so as much as you can streamline it, uh, that helps your analysts. And then finally, uh, just incorporating their job responsibilities. It's like if they're held accountable for it, they're going to do it. And ISAC is also helping a little bit with that, uh, encouraging them to contribute because uh, they can uh, win in a challenge we have and uh, get recognized for doing such. Wow, that sounds fun. Okay, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, and then actually one last point on that is, like, it all comes down to trust. And we've got a lot of opportunities for analysts to engage with each other. And by establishing that trust, the interaction – you increase that trust level with the legal agreements and increase trust. So that way people are much more comfortable sharing information. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's excellent. That's excellent. Well, appreciate that overview too. That's really great. Uh, next, I want to go to Katrina and Katrina, uh, based on your purview, I was thinking about uh, that, the loop of information sharing, you know, how do you think those involved in that loop benefit? Great question. Um, I think uh, I, I can say, like, coming from the shoes of a practitioner um, initially and a consumer of intelligence, uh, you at times uh, can be bombarded with a lot of information um, that is that's helpful, um, but it not, not, it isn't necessarily a curated intelligence in a sense. I think uh, like the loop of information, uh, the feedback loop of information is actually highly beneficial, especially uh, when you're focused on specific intelligence that's re related to an industry and like the industry vertical in the sense is going to be the oil and gas, uh, oil and natural gas sector. As a practitioner, uh, to receive curated information uh, relevant to your organization is highly helpful. And to be able to actively participate in defining um, and shaping what that actual intelligence is is also highly beneficial. Uh, I recently read an article coming from the purview of a CTI analyst uh, advocating for curating intelligence in-house. That is the best source of intelligence that you're going to be able to have, uh, especially when you're kind of receiving on the receiving end of information. And I think that that's actually a really great approach to handling things, but with the caveat of now being a part of a sharing loop, like an information sharing organization, having that highly curated intelligence that's relevant to your organization and sharing that with other industry professionals um, that also have organizations that represent your vertical is going to obviously provide um, a really beneficial loop in a sense of if they are receiving additional information or if they actually have observables related to the information that you're sharing that might not, that might include additional enriched information that you're not aware of. It's going to obviously bring back into your CTI life cycle to be able to help uh, grow your program and grow your organization and understanding the threat 
that is impacting you potentially in that sense. Uh, Stuart mentioned us kind of working together to build, uh, to rebuild our uh, member submission form to kind of help caveat and curate what information is going to be highly impactful or beneficial to share with other members within the same vertical. And obviously working for an information sharing organization for the oil and natural gas sector, we're going to have information related to threats um, in the sector, but also we do work in a cross-sector capacity with other ISACs, information sharing and analysis centers to understand how these other uh, threats could potentially be impacting other um, sectors. In the time that I've been here, I've, I've gotten a lot of feedback from uh, just members in general about how, how beneficial it is to be a part of the ISAC and the information sharing loop. And of course, ISACs are valuable for so many verticals. That's kind of a glimpse into how they work. You know, back in my days uh, at Gartner, I actually worked with CISOs in Toronto and the FS or Financial Services ISAC was very highly regarded there. So you might want to check out whatever ISAC is for your industry vertical um, to kind of uncork some of that knowledge for, for your organization. All right, up next, we are looking ahead to 2021 and beyond on how threats against the energy sector will evolve. When it comes to the water and energy sector, Trend Micro published a white paper on exposed and vulnerable critical infrastructure in the water and energy industries. Number one, the paper looks at the cyber assets in water and energy sectors and how easy it is to discover these using basic open source intelligence techniques. Number two, after an overview of exposed devices and systems that Trend Micro researchers found, the company enumerates a list of likely attackers and their motives and assesses the damage potential. And number three, in the white paper, Trend Micro provides defensive strategies for protecting protecting the main industrial control system equipment or ICS equipment and the supply chain of the water and energy sectors against attacks. This includes those from third-party contractors and integrators and also insider threats. I am putting a link in the show notes to the white paper. Now what I'd like to do is shift our conversation a little bit. I would love for us to just kind of look ahead to take a glimpse into the future And so I'd like to go around the horn and and give each of you on the panel a chance to answer. And here's the question that I'd like to ask. What are your thoughts about threats to the energy sector in 2021 and beyond? You know, what what, what kind of comes to mind for you? So, Travis, why don't you uh, kick us off on this, if you would? That means you get to go first, which I don't know, that's a blessing and a curse on a panel, right? You don't want to go last. Maybe you don't want to go first, but you're first. So anyway, take a stab at this, if you would. (laughs) Well, um, obviously, uh, the ransomware and espionage aspects of it um, are very profitable for those actors. And so as long as they're making money at what they're doing, they're going to continue to try to make money. And so uh, help holding, you know, municipalities, potentially oil companies, uh, whole cities uh, at, at hostage with their data and making money off of it. They, you know, the insurance companies are paying the ransoms for their clients and so as they continue to make money, they will continue doing it. So moving into 2021, I see that continuing. Um, the nation states uh, aspect of it will continue. Uh, we'll see the election come and go regardless of which way it goes. The nation state threat will, will still, still be there. Um, we'll probably see, you know, geopolitical uh, tensions increase, you know, whichever way the election goes. And so they can impact us as an oil and gas company because of where we operate globally. Um, we'll probably see uh, the, the hacktivism thing uh, come back into play at some point uh, based on the election. Um, and so you'll see that that play out. Uh, hopefully, um, either way, it, it won't. But I can I can foresee that coming back again as, you know, environmental concerns. You see those questions in, in the, the debates and things like that. So that's not going away anytime soon. So that's that's my prediction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of different issues. And, you know, you were talking earlier as well about uh, geopolitics influencing attacks. And it reminded me of an interview I did um, at Secure World Detroit a couple of years ago with a data scientist. And that's what he'd done was track geopolitics and even like presidential visits or prime minister visits to certain parts of the countries or hot button issues that were in the media. 
and he watched the malware spike and the attack spike related to that. So it's really good points um, that you bring up, Travis. Thank you very much. All right, Katrina, uh, let's go to you next and give us your best shot at 2021 and beyond. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with uh, a lot of the things that Travis has mentioned, um, especially, uh, you know, ransomware, as that continues to be uh, a, a pain point for uh, organizations across all sectors. Um, obviously, we've seen the, the, the shift, I think, in some sense of operators that are uh, using extortion or auctions in order to pressure victims into paying. And as Travis mentioned, um, you know, uh, insurance companies pay out um, and kind of puffing up those operators and continuing having them continue that activity, um, it kind of validates, in a, in a sense, um, their operation and, and being able to successfully get what it is that they're, they're after, which is a payment. Um, and I'll say, I'll go further in to say that um, along those lines and in general with uh, adversaries is just um, the communal or kind of like working together aspect of that. I've been seeing a lot of like ransomware operators um, and other adversaries kind of starting to work together. Uh, one operator, uh, one ransomware operator uh, was actually putting out a post uh, to uh, recruit uh, those that might be doing initial access and some other activities in order to gain a percentage of, um, they basically that their organization would kind of gain a percentage of the ransom um, and, and the back end they would also receive a smaller percentage but they are just kind of recruiting others to go out and uh, do their dirty work in a sense so uh, what happens in that and adversaries kind of working together and aligning together to uh, per, uh, you know uh, it's put, uh, sorry push over um, whatever their objective is um, we obviously need to stay steadfast in an information sharing organization to work together to kind of combat that um, because their you know their defenses um, sorry their their operations, in a sense, are um, kind of growing. Um, I would say, additionally, uh, 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 attacks focusing on cloud security um, is going to be continue to be a thing uh, that we're seeing in uh, 2021. Um, just with uh, the amount of folks that continue to, to shift to the cl- uh, cloud, uh, getting rid of on-prem devices, um, attacks that are obviously leveraging any sort of uh, infrastructure attacks on larger cloud providers, AWS, Azure, whatever that might be. We're going to continue to see that being a thing, threat vectors that are um, actively targeting uh, Azure or, or some some other uh, vendor, in a sense, of um, cloud security providers. Or I, I would see that being a trend as well, um, as, as, as m- many of the others that Travis uh, mentioned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great points. And, and definitely, I mean, we've seen an acceleration toward the cloud, right? Because we had to, as Angela mentioned, as the r- workforce went remote. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting, Katrina, that you brought up, was the idea that, you know, these bad actors are collaborating. They're working together, right? And that's one of the reasons we need to be here together at Secure World, even if it's only virtual. It's another argument for being a part of the ONG ISAC and everything else, because we need to team up as well. So I, I love that you brought that point up. All right, Stuart, uh, let's go to you next. And what are you thinking for 2021 and beyond? Uh, so I think some really great points have been made. I think uh, particularly when we're talking about criminal actors, uh, extortion, uh, blackmail type activity, uh, whether it be ransomware disclosing data, uh, that's going to continue to mature. I mean, some of the ransomware as a service operators already have better customer service than some of our business software vendors. Uh, they're going to continue to learn and adapt and go where the money is. Uh, we may actually see new methods of trying to extort money out of businesses uh, through other forms of denial. It may go back to the old denial of service attacks, or it might come up with something new. Uh, but one of the things we have to be concerned about as a continuing trend is the sort of proliferation. I'm going to mispronounce it. Uh, cyber weapon proliferation as Advanced attack techniques are created by your more sophisticated actors. They get incorporated into tools used by the cyber criminals, and eventually there's point-and-click attack tools that are published out on the Internet that just anybody can use, the hacktivist or whoever. And so unlike uh, actual kinetic weapons where to build an atomic bomb, you have to have access to the right engineering, the right materials, etc., you can contain that with cyber weapons once it's out there Everybody has access to it. So all that is going to keep flowing down. But I also expect we're going to see more stories about the good guys and their successes, uh, whether it be uh, U.S. Cyber Command taking down botnets or uh, arrests made by the FBI with uh, 
by partnerships with other countries or uh, just the successes with the ISACs and our companies working together. Uh, we'll start to hear more and more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hope you're right on that one. And, and and for sure, Stuart, we have seen already that uptick that you're talking about, you know, for FBI arrests or federal government arrests and indictment of hackers or hacking groups. And and that's great. So let's hope that trend continues. Thank you for your overview there. All right, Angela, I, you have the blessing slash curse of going last. So what do you think about 2021 and beyond? Well, if you had asked me the question last year this time, Bruce, I would have never been able to have predicted the, the, the changes that have happened this year due to the pandemic. So I feel like we almost have to be able to go with the flow. <laughs> but one <laughs> I think thing it's is a good idea, sure. yes. <laughs> <laughs> one thing is for sure in, in my time at the Bureau is the criminals are going to try to continue to take advantage of uh, fraud opportunities and schemes to make money. Um, that is not going away anytime soon. Um, so some things will stay the same. Uh, the attack vectors are, are going to be widely the same with phishing and, uh, and you know, websites that are watering holes and, um, you know, spoofed, ad, uh, spoofed websites that want to steal your credentials that can be very con- convincing looking. This is something our members are, are facing when they're just trying to conduct their business, but some bad guy is, is spoofing that, that they are um, not who they say they are. So some things will stay the same. Um, I think with with regard to trends, uh, and I'm going to have to get my magic eight ball out here, but I think that, you know, we are growing and, and continue to trend toward plugging more things into the internet, both in the industrial side and in the personal side. Uh, so at work and at home, um, you know, those access points are still going to be vulnerabilities and, and attack vectors. And so increase awareness about protecting those devices and the remote access. Um, I think uh, operational technology, they, we really have to focus on uh, that side of the house as well. So um, I encourage everybody to continue to practice with incident response uh, exercises, have a plan, exercise the plan, and, and be part of a community that is working together uh, in to, to, you know, Make everybody better by joining together than individually, like Travis was talking about. So I think that is going to continue to trend in a positive direction as well. That's Thank great. You. Yeah, appreciate that optimism too from both you and Stuart looking forward because we need that in 2020, right? Any optimism, <laughs> we'll take it. So thank you so much. I mean, Travis and Katrina, Stuart and Angela, this was a fantastic discussion. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, I love panel discussions because they help surface and summarize key thoughts around a topic. Don't you think that? I mean, every time I go to a panel, I think, yes, I see a theme or yes, I, I like what that person said, right? It just kind of helps summarize things even in your own mind. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed today's panel discussion as much as I did. Thanks again to the ONG ISAC uh, for helping you know share that value, not only at Secure World Texas, but here on the podcast as well. And I I will put a link to the ONG ISAC in the show notes, and you can also check out your own verticals version of an ISAC uh, and tap into some of that knowledge. Also, thank you again to Trend Micro for being our premier podcast partner. Well, on behalf of the entire Secure World team, I'm Bruce Sussman, your host. We'll see you again on Tuesday.